All right, let's turn this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This morning I'm going to read verses 1 through 13. Though I'm not going to cover 1 through 13 in just one sermon. This is the word of the Lord. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death. Because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We're poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become, and are still, like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. My ESV chapter division has the title over chapter 4, The Ministry of the Apostles. I think I'm going to replace that when I edit my own Bible, so that when we get to chapter 4, it's going to be titled, Paul and the Corinthians. This time, it's personal. Because that's what's going on here in chapter 4. Paul is ready to confront the Corinthians directly. Now we know from chapter 1 that not every believer in Corinth is against Paul. And actually say that to yourself. There were believers in Corinth who were against Paul. All right, then. We know that there was at least a contingent in the church that said, I am of Paul. But at the same time, there is an opposition party in Corinth who are opposed to Paul. And why they are opposed will come out more and more as we continue through chapter 4. And I will tell you up front, that there is a lot riding on what's taking place in chapter 4. 
It also may explain, that is the more personal nature of chapter 4, why this chapter in 1 Corinthians is not as familiar to Bible readers as others, even in Corinthians, right? You know about 1 Corinthians 13, you know about 1 Corinthians 15, um, chapter 8 and 7, and even if you could just grab a couple of verses out of those chapters, but chapter 4 sounds so personal, and at least at first reading, we're a little bit on the outside listening in to this private, if you will, conversation. Actually, if 117 came to a close in verses 20 and 21, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the reading chapter 4. Um, so let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. That would have been the perfect rounding off of the section that began, in, say, chapter 1, verse 10. And we could easily turn the page to chapter, well, to chapter 5, verse 1, and as Paul starts to go through the various things that he has to deal with, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. But instead, we get this addition, this addendum to what we've been reading. And it's about Paul and either his co-workers or his apostles or some combination of the two. Now, when John Calvin came to chapter 4, I think he actually jumped the gun on this text by moving directly to an application of the text. And I'm going to read to you what he said to illustrate the point. He says, here there are three things to be considered in their order. In the first place, Paul describes the office of a pastor of the church. Secondly, he shows that it is not enough for anyone to produce a title or even to undertake the duty, a faithful administration of the office being requisite. Thirdly, as the judgment formed of him by the Corinthians was preposterous, he calls both himself and them to the judgment seat of Christ. In the first place, then, he teaches in what estimation every teacher in the church ought to be held. Well, I think that's a fine application. That is an extension of what Paul is saying in chapter 4. Because, in a sense, pastors who are not apostles may be likened to apostles in the work that they do. And so there are similarities between that original office and the office that followed them, elders and teaching elders in the church. But by going directly to Paul describes the office of a pastor of the church, he misses what's obvious, that this really is about the Apostle Paul himself and his apostolic colleagues. So I would have preferred it if Calvin had said, there are three things to be considered in their order. In the first place, how you Corinthians should see me, the Apostle Paul, how you should evaluate me, apart from the worldly wisdom that has infiltrated your church. And so not only have we not left chapter 1 verses 17 through 19 behind, we also hear threads of what we're reading in chapter 4 in chapters 2 and more clearly in chapter 3. And so it goes on. Paul continues to rebuke the church's infatuation with worldly wisdom 
which coincides with their rejection of God's wisdom. And he does it now by putting himself forward. Paul the Apostle, not just pastors. Paul the Apostle as something of a living extension of Christ himself, which he does here and elsewhere in the New Testament. So at the simplest level, this confirms what I've been arguing all along, that Jesus' death on a cross outside the gates of Jerusalem is not just a way to get in the church, that is salvation, it is itself the value system for those who stay in the church for the duration of the present age. Let's call it what it is, wisdom for life. Wisdom for life together. And this is further borne out by Jesus' appointed witnesses, his apostles, whose message, of course, is announced in words, and we have those words in more than one place, but the message of the cross is also announced to the world by their way of life. Right? Not just the words, but by the lifestyle imposed upon them by the Lord of the church, which is under the cross. So Paul's sharp rebuke of a church's rival value system, and that's what it is, it's a rival value system, is so sharp that it reaches a crescendo of sorts in the passage that I read. I won't reread it in its entirety, but to acquaint you once more with it, already you have all you want. You have become rich without us, probably since we left you, Things have just taken off for you. The stock market goes up every day. You're kings. And you know what? I wish you were kings because life for us is miserable. But if you were kings, we might come under your reign and enjoy some of the benefits of your rule over the world, you Corinthians. Because here's how it is for us. God has exhibited us. That is, God himself has put us on display as last of all, like men sentenced to death. Yes, this is sarcasm. And it's powerfully, rhetorically impressive. It's making the point. It's actually a kind of a, really a nasty bit of rhetoric. And so Paul as he often does, shifts back in verse 14. Look, I do not write these things to you to make you ashamed. Not too ashamed anyway. But to admonish you as my beloved children. But you needed to hear that tone in my voice. To realize how serious this matter is. And I would say that Paul wanted to leave a mark when he spoke that way to them, if not a welt that would last for a while in his rebuke. So for us, as we are looking on from a distance, we are called to consider both sides in the dispute. We do this knowing first that one side faithfully represents the will of the risen Lord in word and in deed. And second, that the other side, the church side, represents the all too real pitfalls that Christians must face in their earthly pilgrimage, including the rejection of cross wisdom in favor of worldly wisdom. So to, to put it another way, and this is true really for the whole series, 
It always comes back to whose side are you on? Are you on the side of God's wisdom and all that that represents? Or on the side of worldly wisdom and all the benefits that you accrue that are immediate and tangible and satisfying, but are ultimately anti-Christ? Well, because this is the, the first of the sermons in this, pass, in this chapter, let me give you a brief word about some background, some context. Paul may have been hinting at this, this more personal side of the Corinthians' defection from the cross as early as chapter 2. I mentioned this in passing in verses 14 and 15. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And keep that word discerned in mind. The spiritual person, on the other hand, judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. Hmm. It's making a little more sense now that we are in chapter 4. Now the key word in 2, 14 through 15, and in chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, is a Greek word that has a range of meaning. And I'll give it to you briefly, because it really is, it's pertinent to how we read the text. It can mean to engage in careful study of a question. That is to question or examine someone or something. It can mean to conduct a judicial hearing, to hear a case, to ask questions. Or it can mean to, exam to examine with a view to finding fault, judge, call to account, discern. We saw the word judge used most frequently in those two passages, but I would say that's not the best choice here because for us, judge, its primary connotation is, you know, something in a, in a legal context. So the New American Standard went with the word examine, and the New Living Translation went with the words evaluate and examine. And I think that gets to the point better in verses 2 through 3. Um, excuse me, 3 through 4. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be examined or evaluated by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even evaluate myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who examines me or evaluates me. And here's what I think is going on. The Corinthians under the influence of more impressive, in a worldly sense, teaching, are now looking back at their beginnings as a Christian church, and they're taking a second and more critical look at the Apostle Paul. But they've changed their glasses. And so now they're looking at Paul not with the original glasses that he provided them, Christ crucified, but with the glasses of worldly wisdom and a value system that elevates charismatic, dynamic leaders and speakers who make an impression in the community. This becomes clearer all the way forward in chapter 9. We'll probably be dipping into chapter 9 more than once because it brings out part of the, the nature of the conflict. Paul has just said that he'll become vegan if eating meat, period, would cause a weaker brother to stumble. 
I'll stop eating meat then. If it, am I allowed to eat meat? Oh yes, by all means I am. And I love that juicy burger in Ephesus you get, you know, with the onions and the pickles. They put a little blue cheese. Oh. Paul said, I won't eat it again. I'll give it up. I'm entitled to it, but I'll give it up. And then he goes on to say in chapter 9, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I'm not an apostle, meaning if to others who have now come into the church and are holding sway, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. There it is. It's out in the open. Same word. Evaluate, examine, or judge. Do we have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Make that your life verse. We endure anything. And you're thinking back to chapter 4 now, and that sarcastic interaction. This is why Paul is being reevaluated, because he lives under the cross. And it means for him deprivation. And when you look at that with human wisdom, you think, wisdom. wisdom. You think, what an idiot. He could be making a living from those Corinthians. In fact, it could be like a, every place he plants a church, they could send him 10% of their donations for the rest of his life. And by the age of 40, he could retire. Paul says, Look, I'm an, I've seen Jesus. None of you guys can say that. But because I've adopted the wisdom of God, I will endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. And so he continues, I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such Provision for I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. This is Paul's world, and please read what Gordon Fee wrote in the bookshelf quote. It, le it sheds such light on this interaction here. So I'll stop there on uh, 1 Corinthians 9 for now, but what I'm saying is. A significant faction in Corinth is now reevaluating Paul, and they have the new reference points of worldly wisdom. And when measured that way, well, Paul comes out wanting. In fact, <clears throat> it's a little bit of an embarrassment, truth be told. 
And so, Paul has gone from being a skilled master builder who laid Jesus Christ crucified as the temple's foundation in Corinth to an embarrassment. An embarrassment to the, stat- to the now status conscious believers. Come to think of it, some of them were saying out loud, you know, Paul was hardly an impressive individual, right? Remember his weakness? Remember his fear? Remember his much trembling? Remember his milk for babies teaching? Ugh. And what his Corinthian opponents are about to learn, or may learn, or relearn, is that they mustn't mistake Paul's weakness, his lack of eloquence, or his milk for babies teaching as cringeworthy. The problem isn't Paul. The problem is the human status point of view that the Corinthians have adopted. It's the fault not of the one evaluated, but of the evaluators, not of the one examined, but the examiners. So these so-called weaknesses, says Paul, and this is crucial, they are in fact part of a trust, a stewardship from Christ himself, whose evaluation is the only evaluation that matters, and it is the only evaluation that Paul lives for. So with the lines now drawn more clearly between Paul and the anti-Paul faction or factions, though really it's ultimately the line drawn between human or worldly wisdom and God's wisdom revealed at the cross, Paul begins to set them straight. And by doing so, he sets us straight as well. Now, I only have one point this morning. Then I'm going to go off on a crazy tangent, and then we'll be done. My single point this morning is servants are only answerable to their lords. Servants are only answerable to their lords or masters. And often, Lord is translated as master. This is how one should regard us, right? That's picking up from chapter 3, verse 5 and following. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Servants, field hands, hired help, through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. Now he's fleshing this out further. Okay, Corinthians, how should you think of us? Well, we are servants of Christ, who, and Paul is now developing what he introduced in chapter 2, who has entrusted us with, or committed to our care, God's mysteries. And this defines our service. We are stewards of God's mysteries, which is, of course, what we call the gospel plan and redemptive history which reached its climax in the death and resurrection of Jesus in the announcement of the gospel to the world. Now, if you want to know what it means to be stewards of the mysteries of God, all you have to do is read verse 2. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. That's it. 
That's the essence of stewardship in one short sentence. Webster couldn't have said it any better. They are to be found faithful, that is, to the one they serve. You know that, right? That's not, you don't have to go to seminary to discover that. You don't have to read the Corpus Hellenicum or whatever it is to figure that out. Stewards are to be found faithful. That's the whole job description. It's why Calvin can quite rightly extend 4, 1 through 5 to pastors, as long as you don't skip step 1, because we are also Christ's servants. Which means I'm not your servant, actually. It's a strange relationship we have, and what all pastors have with congregations. And the, 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 the drive for a steward is he must give an account. There. When you were in school, did you ever have a test that you didn't study for? Or a paper you were supposed to deliver in class that you didn't prepare? That's a kind of stewardship. There's a date when the work must be done. The teacher isn't a slave master. He or she doesn't come over to your house and make sure with a stopwatch that you put three hours a night into the work. I used to tell my students, look, you know, here it is. I'm playing. I'm giving you dates, times, assignments. Ask me anything. Let me encourage you to do a little bit of work each night so that when it's Monday night at 1130 and you have the test first thing in the morning, you don't crack the book then. How do you feel? Kind of anxious, right? What an idiot. Why did I spend all that time watching TV? That's how stewards are to think. I know that I'm responsible to deliver an account, an explanation to one person at a time to be determined in the future. And if I want to avoid the anxiety of not being able to give a good account, I will be a good steward. And of course, the whole context here is eschatological, but I'm not going to look at that this morning. We'll just continue. Lords or masters give their stewards an explicit charge and a work to perform. When that work is completed, when the charge is carried out, the steward reports back to the Lord in order to receive his assessment. What could be simpler? The servant, the steward, can expect one of two reports on his efforts and probably the means by which he accomplished uh, the work. His master, his kurios, his lord, can say to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. Seeing that you have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Here that word faithful appears twice. Well done, good and faithful slave. You have been faithful over a little. I'm ready now to increase your stewardship. Or his master can answer him and say, You wicked and slothful servant. Hey guys, cast this worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, two possible outcomes. Which outcome are you going to work for if you're a steward? So, by the time he gets to verse 3, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be examined by you or by any human court. He's basically saying, look Corinthians, you're not the boss of me. I don't answer to you. You may be performing this job evaluation, but sorry, you're not my, bo my boss. And even though I have a servant's heart toward you, 
In fact, he loves them as a father loves children. Don't mistake that heart for some craven desire that I have for human approval and admiration. I don't care about that. I don't answer to you. I answer to Christ. And in light of Paul's actual experience in his missionary service, when he refers to the human court, which is really the human day, which may be a reference to the day of judgment, it's probably literal. He doesn't answer to a court, he answers to Christ. And then he goes on to say, I do not even examine myself. This might be a text to challenge those forms of Christian piety that are overly private with their stress on self-examination and the searching of one's heart and conscience for secret sins or failings it becomes very introspective. Richard Hayes says, Paul would regard such detailed self-assessment as fruitful, fruitless navel-gazing. And I think that's right, if for no other reason than our own weakness to self-deception. Now, to take this a step further, well, what standard should you use if you engage in self-examination? Well, you must come to the question with God's wisdom made known in Jesus' crucifixion. Otherwise, you're off to a bad start. But more to the point, Paul wants to stress to his Corinthian examiners that there is just one Lord that he is accountable to. Not to them, and really not even to himself. And remember, the day of the Lord is at hand. I am not aware of anything against myself, but even if I'm not aware of that, I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce the judgment before the time, that is, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God, that is, whether his stewardship was successful or a failure. And that's all I'm going to say about that today. Now I'm going to get something off my chest. I'll pause for a minute so you can all feel a little bit anxious inside. Now what I want to say this morning, it's kind of personal, but I'm tired of the Muslims. Tired of the Muslim world. Or maybe it's better to say, I, I, I'm just fed up with Islam itself. If I turn on the news and see one more Arab street where the enraged protesters are yelling Allahu Akbar, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go list in the Marines or something. Because I've been, I'm 64 years old, I've been watching the same movie over and over and over and over again for 44 years. Ever since I began watching the nightly news each night, way back during the endless Iranian hostage crisis that began in 1979. Death to America, death to Carter, Death to Shaw. A joke went around, if you're older you may remember it, that people started singing Bomb Iran to the tune of the Beach Boys' Barbara Ann. I won't dare try and reproduce it here this morning, but you can sing it to yourself with all the ba-ba-ba's at the beginning. And at the time, I probably wouldn't think that was the wisest course, but it sure would have felt good. I want to say, don't you guys over there know any other songs to sing? Are you all one-hit wonders with this death to everybody in the world? 
I think their creed, the Muslim creed, is made up of a core belief. This is what we stand for in the world. Violent revenge based on some archaic, twisted version of honor. And women and girls are too often on the receiving end of that male madness. They're either forced into undesirable ma uh, marriages, sometime before the age of even 10, which often translates into a functional slavery, or as National Geographic reported, very dramatic suicides. Islam is a man's religion and it gives power to males who in turn use it to debase their females. And I ought to know because I watch YouTube. Mm -hmm. yep. I watch TV. Someone may ask me, have you ever read the Quran? <clears throat> no. Well, I mean, maybe a verse here and there. So you may be judging in other people's religion because you read a random verse from their holy book. Well, surely whoever is arguing that way is representing the religion fairly, right? Just like Richard Dawkins does with the Bible. He pulls stuff out, you go, ooh, yeah, that doesn't sound good when you put it that way. No, I, I just know this. Trust me. Someone may ask, well, do you personally know any Muslims? No, not that I can think of. I mean, I'm sure I've met some sometime in the past. I, I must have talked to a Muslim sometime. I just, I couldn't recall. Anyway, I just know, okay? I know what Islam's all about. Now to make sure everyone gets my point, or I'll be dead tomorrow morning, when the thought was put on my head, I'm using what is a very real and visceral response to images that are mediated to me by people who have a stake in my feelings and emotions to make a point. That everything that I know or know about Islam is based on a Western mediated presentation of the religion, which just so happens to coincide with major violent eruptions in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah, I've done a little serious reading on the subject, but hardly enough to matter. My point here is this. In my head, Islam's reputation as a religion is a very poor reputation. Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. How many people know exactly what Christianity teaches because of what they've seen on TV? Or what they read in the papers? Or what they read in history about Europe? About conquest in the West Indies and in Mexico and South America? or for that matter, North America. How many people know exactly as much as I know about Islam, about Christianity, because they just know it? And add to that, what do you call it, confirmation bias? And it becomes even worse. This is very much what is at stake in Paul's dispute with Corinth. The Corinthians, he foresees it, he foresees it in other churches too, Corinthians may keep on bearing the name Christian, but they are on the edge of redefining Christianity from the ground up. So that the people who are outside the church in Corinth will never get a chance to see the real thing. 
And if it pushes Christ crucified aside for anything else, then our corporate stewardship, for we have been entrusted with the ministry of the Word as a church, will be judged and judged severely. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, on the one hand, it is a glorious privilege mm. to bear the name of Jesus Christ in the world, that He openly identifies with us just as we openly identify with Him. And yet with that privilege, comes a frightening responsibility. If we are to continue on as representatives of Jesus in the world, but forsake what is essential to our Christian identity and witness, then what have we become but poor stewards of the mysteries of godliness? Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us when you see us being drawn like iron to a magnet to rival ways of promoting Christianity in the world that are inconsistent with this essential wisdom revealed at Jesus' crucifixion. Keep us, we pray, on that straight and narrow road so that conscious of our stewardship, and the account that we must give, we will persevere adopting the wisdom of a crucified Savior as our message and our way of life. Visit us now, we pray, with grace, so that what we've asked for may be met with your approval and your strengthening and your encouragement and even your good pleasure. Now as we turn to the Lord's table, where we come in contact once more with the essence of our faith, we pray that you would minister to us by the grace of the Holy Spirit as we pray these things through Christ. Amen. Just to be clear about my rant, I'm not even making a judgment as to what is and what isn't in authentic Islam. How do I know? I can't even read Arabic, let alone read the Quran. There are 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. It's a pretty small sample size, what I get through the television and what riles up my emotions, but I'm no judge of Islam. I just don't want Christianity be, to be judged by any other point of view or evaluation than the one that is inherent in its message, which is presented to us every week when we come to the Lord's table. Yes, this is the place where God seals us in His covenant promises. This is the place where, in a small way, we renew that new covenant that was made in the blood of Jesus, which provides for us the forgiveness of our sins, of course. But it's also an announcement as to what Christianity is to be throughout the ages whether in Europe or in China or in Southeast Asia or in Gaza or Israel or Lebanon, everywhere in the world, it comes back to this. This is why we observe the Lord's Supper as that ongoing memorial, because it enshrines, as it were, the death of Jesus Christ for sinners as the wisdom of God for us to adopt ourselves. 
So if you are a Christian this morning and a member of the church, you are more than welcome to come here and receive that precious reminder that you have been justified by faith alone. And this signifies and seals to you in its own way that the forgiveness of sins has come to you in Jesus and is now confirmed to you by His Holy Spirit. But also see beyond those immediate benefits. See it in the Apostle Paul himself that there is a way of life set for us here that's unnerving. But like good stewards, not only will we have to give an account, but like Jesus, we have future glory in view for the duration. If you are not a Christian this morning, then please don't come to the Lord's table. It is a place for the family of God to eat and fellowship together. And you may come to speak with me or to one of the elders about what it means to be a Christian, but just don't participate in the supper this morning. But to the rest of you, come on, let's eat and drink together and celebrate the glory of our risen Savior.